Again, my name is Greg Vigor and I'm with the City of Lakewood. I'm the stormwater manager there in, in Pierce County. And uh, some of you might have been in uh, Dan Smith's presentation was uh, right before ours. And I think our uh, data hopefully will complement what he had to talk about regarding illicit discharge. And I did want to find out a little bit about the audience. Um, how many municipal permittees do we have in the audience? If you could just raise your hands. Okay, so a pretty big majority. How about uh, state or federal government folks? Okay. And how about either consultants or manufacturers, those type of folks? Okay, so mainly a lot of municipal permittees, so this will be preaching to the choir a bit. So the city of Lakewood uh, got a, one of the grants in the first round of the what was the regional stormwater monitoring program. Now it's called the stormwater action monitoring um, to do a, a study on business inspections related to stormwater. And um, one of the things that, uh, my clicker here. One of the things that we looked at that was somewhat separate was uh, illicit discharge. That was something that ecology asked us to, to look at uh, in addition to our business inspection. So we're gonna be talking about the illicit discharge component of that today. And again, um, the money came from all the various municipal permittees, including Lakewood, to fund the project. Yeah. And um, we hired, I guess it was originally Cardno, if you look at any of our data on, on the uh, ecology website, we hired Cardno Government Services initially, and then a number of the key staff from Cardno left and moved to Aspect. So Cardno was gracious enough to, to let the work go uh, to Aspect, which we greatly appreciated that, kept, kept our project going. And again, um, hopefully all of you are familiar with illicit discharge detection and, and what that means. And I mentioned that uh, this is part of a, a bigger study, but related. And again, uh, hopefully all have heard about uh, source identification information repository. We like a lot of acronyms as, I guess, engineers and scientists. So this would be one of those. This comes right out of our stormwater permit in section uh, 8D, which is monitoring and assessment. And there's a, a group of folks, uh, municipal permittees that are part of a, a subgroup of the stormwater uh, work group that have been working on this, this CIDR project. It's a, a, a database that's available for municipalities to input their uh, illicit discharge detection. It's currently voluntary. And um, so there hasn't been a lot of folks uh, that have used it. So that's, that's, I guess, part of what we're, we're looking at here to, to hope to improve on some of that. There was an original uh, form done in 2014, um, and then there's going to be an update to that form uh, based on, on the results of, of our study. So there's a number of goals and objectives for CIDR, and really the, the bottom line is, you know, we're looking to identify the most common types and sources of IDD that folks are finding out there and see if we can help identify any trends and patterns. And that's what, that's what we're doing here with this effort. So we looked at uh, data from the 2014 year for, I don't remember how many municipalities there were that were, that were. Okay, so we had 71 uh, municipalities that reported that submitted their data and we had like 2,900 uh, different records that, that we looked at. And a number of questions you know, that we were trying to address. Um, how do the permittees, what kind of data, or how are they submitting the data? What, what uh, methods are they using in their IDD work? And what type of events are being re reported? And the data comes right from the annual reports. That's what was looked at. Um, if you're a phase one permittee, I think it's question number 48. And if you're a phase two like myself, it's question number 20. And I, I think part of the challenge is the way the questions are written, it's, it really lends itself to a descriptive um, answer, which makes it sort of difficult if you want to, uh, you know, spreadsheet data, for example. So I know the stuff we did was all in uh, Word documents um, because the, their, the answers were looking for a descriptive answer. So that was part of the, the challenge with this uh, effort. And so this is um, the types of data that we got. Uh, three different formats. We had Word documents, PDFs, which was the most, as well as Excel. 
And we ended up with nine different formats from database output, um, descriptive lists, all the way to tables. And uh, again, as you can see, the, what was mainly sent in was, was PDFs. So this created certainly a kind of a big lift for the consultants as far as you know, trying to, to disseminate this information. Uh, so it ended up uh, being a longer effort than, than was expected just because of that. Um, fortunately, Ecology was able to lend an, an intern, which helped, I know, the consultants greatly in, in uh, doing that work. And um, the result was, ended up being 71 different data fields. And I'm going to invite James up to talk more about the data. All right, thank you, Greg. So um, just diving right into the, uh, some of the results here. Um, as Greg mentioned, there were uh, almost 3,000 records, 2913 in total, submitted by the permittees. Um, and I've got a few pie charts just to show the overall spread of data. And this first pie chart shows uh, whether or not an incident was con conclusively found or not, or if the record was inconclusive in that regard. Um, as Greg mentioned before, I'm just going to flip back to this previous si slide. Um, the, because of the variable formats of data that were submitted by permittees, there were multiple approaches that were required, so, uh, including uh, copying and pasting from, uh, for example, spreadsheet tables, but also reading and interpreting uh, the notes uh, for some of the records. So that uh, resulted in us uh, realizing that we weren't able to conclusively know whether or not an incident occurred all the time. So the data were coded in that regard. So of the uh, incident records where there was uh, a conclusive incident, we broke that down further as the second set of pie charts shows divided by the uh, uh, phase one and phase two permit permittees. Um, and it shows the uh, distribution uh, of illicit discharges, which compri compri comprise the vast majority. Uh, there were a handful of illicit connections. Again, the inconclusive records are, uh, uh, are shown here. And also, uh, as you can see, there are a fair amount of non-IDD incidents reported. And uh, the non-IDD incidents were those uh, where things like allowable discharge ended up being the type of just, uh, uh, discharge that was reported. Also reports that were not really related to IDD, such as solid waste dumping, or, um, and this is something that Dan from Pierce County also mentioned, where uh, a report was made or a complaint was made, but it was unable to be verified. So uh, those were uh, sometimes classified as non-IDDE. Okay, moving on to the uh, distribution of the records over the year. As we mentioned, this was uh, intended to be an assessment of data submitted from the 2014 calendar year, and the vast majority of data were from that year, but uh, interestingly, some data from other years also crept into the data that were submitted by permittees, and that's shown here. Um, so a couple of things just to mention here, I wanna just, whoops, sorry, uh, mention that the null category shown here uh, is capturing the records where just insufficient date information was provided. Um, so there, there were a handful of records uh, like that. But looking at the distribution of, uh, of events uh, across the year, um, you can see that there's kind of a spike here in October, maybe another one in March. But to my eye, there isn't really a clear pattern that shows necessarily uh, more incidents occurring in the winter. Uh, interestingly, there seems to be a, a little spike here in June. Um, so, but again, this is just for one year uh, worth of data. All right, for the data analysis, um, as Greg mentioned, because the permit uh, and report questions ask for a description of how the events were, uh, incidents were addressed, that resulted in data being almost entirely categorical and not qual uh, quantitative. Uh, therefore, we chose uh, appropriate uh, analyses, and that included primarily a v uh, analysis of the distribution of data. Um, we also did some statistics, and that uh, was based on a frequency analysis where we used uh, the maximum likelihood chi-square statistic, which essentially um, compares two distributions of variables. And what we did was we, we chose pairs of variables from the database to compare, and the chi-square test specifically tells us if there's some relationship or not. Uh, but put to, put, to put it into terms of statistics, it, sort of a null hypothesis, it tells us if there's a non-random association between those two uh, variables that were compared. And it should be, uh, but, but this type of uh, analysis really incident highlights um, the types of incidents that were reported and how they were addressed, but it's not a causative type of assessment where 
uh, these statistics uh, indicate what the cause uh, necessarily is of these, um, of these uh, pollution incidents. Okay, so uh, because the data were, were reported in a qualitative way by description, um, that included a lot of different descriptions for the same thing. So what we had to do was review the data and categorize it, uh, and that was done through a standardization process. So I'm gonna highlight seven data fields here um, that we categorized and were used uh, for the analysis. For the type of pollutant, uh, 53, um, yeah, 53 discrete pollutants were reported, and those were categorized into these eight categories shown here. For the source of the pollutant, uh, 58 sources, uh, discrete sources were reported, and those are categori categorized into these seven categories shown here. Next, how the incident was learned about. Um, there were 19 different ways that the incidents were learned about, and those were grouped into these three categories here with a non-applicable category where that information simply was not provided in the record. Fourth, what was the indicator methods used to detect what type of pollutant it was. If it wasn't obvious what, uh, what the pollution is, then there's a whole series of uh, indicator method testing that can be used. 18 methods were reported and those were grouped into these four categories shown here. Next, what, what type of source tracing method was used? The source tracing is often used in conjunction with indicator method for those who uh, have done that kind of work. So 10 source tracing methods were reported and those were grouped into these three categories here. Next, what were the methods used to correct or eliminate uh, the, the discharges? 13 discrete actions were shown, and uh, those were grouped into these five categories shown here. Lastly, the discharge quantity. Discharge quantity was something that we added to the analysis partway through because it's not required to report how much uh, quantity of discharge occurred, but many records did include some information. But as you can see, those were reported in 174 discrete descriptions that range from all over the board from a range of like 100 to 1,000 gallons or um, it, I can go on. But uh, those were grouped into these categories here from very small uh, to very large as well as uh, the records where this information was not captured. And just to give you a sense, very small in our scheme referred to less than 100 gallons, very large referred to greater than 100,000 gallons. All right. Okay, so moving on. So I've got six slides here that show the histograms of how the data were distributed according to those key fields that we categorized. Uh, uh, and I'm just gonna, we included graphs just for six, but not seven of those key fields. The, the field that we're leaving out is discharge quantity because relatively few records included that information. So it's really not worth showing. So turning to the distribution of the types of pollutants that occurred, and just to help people get oriented here. So we've got phase one records across the top, phase two across the bottom, and then each stacked histogram bar is divided up into these four categories of illicit discharge, illicit connection, inconclusive data, or if it was a non-ID event uh, in the first place. Okay, so, um, whoops. As you can see, the most common uh, pollutants that were reported by both phase ones and phase twos were hydrocarbons and vehicle fluids. Again, this is a categorization of all these uh, I think there were 53 discrete pollutants. So this captures everything related to uh, vehicles um, and other hydrocarbons. Next, uh, what, next most common were sediment, but also that includes reports of soil uh, and also construction um, uh, pollutants uh, such as concrete waste or, or a, a lime discharge. And it's interesting to note here that um, the uh, the, for phase ones, uh, it seems to be a relatively greater proportion of the third most common type of pollutant, which is industrial discharge, whereas phase twos, uh, less than half as many were reported for that. Okay, a couple other things here. I'm not gonna spend too long on each slide, but uh, there are some highlights. As you can see, the illicit connections are captured under the sewage category for the most part, although there are some, kind of hard to see, but there's a thin blue sliver here uh, indicating some illicit connections were under the cleaning chemicals category. Um, and then I want to highlight, lastly, this uh, category here of other. The other is kind of a catch-all for pollutants that didn't really fit any of the other seven categories. And as you can see, both phase ones and phase twos had a fair number of non-IDD events that were captured in this other category. Um, and that includes uh, incidents where it was an unspecified pollutant. For example, just turbid water was reported or foam, something that wasn't really 
Um, you couldn't tell if it was an actual pollutant, so we just categorized it as other. All right, moving on to the next uh, set of histograms here about the sources of the pollutants. Again, we have phase ones on the top, phase twos on the bottom, and these seven categories of pollutant sources on the bottom. Um, the majority of the, of the uh, sources came from uh, things related to spills, dumping, and also uh, runoff related events. Um, runoff related events refers to issues of like stormwater run on onto a property that may be perfectly um, you know, natural based on the grade and other things, but those were still uh, included in this, in this category. Uh, second most common was uh, about the same between uh, construction related sources and sources related to something with a pipe, either an illicit connection or a leaking pipe. And, um, and those were the same for both phase ones and phase twos. All right, moving on here. Oh, I'm sorry, we did want to highlight one other thing. We did have this category of auto repair and auto body. As you can see, there were not very many incidents that fell into that categories of, of an auto repair shop being the source of pollutants. And the reason why we chose that specific source is because there's been a lot of attention on the auto repair and auto body industry. Um, and, and we just wanted to try to capture some granularity uh, in that regard and separate out those data. Okay, moving on to the, uh, the ways that uh, these incidents were uh, notified. Um, as you can see, the, the three notification categories are along the bottom here, and the most common were those reported directly to the jurisdiction by either a hotline or some other reporting method. Usually uh, many uh, jurisdictions have a website uh, in, where, where citizens or others can, can make these types of reports. So that's included in this, uh, this first category. Um, I also wanna just highlight something here that um, as you can see, the phase one records were pretty evenly distributed across these three notification categories. Whereas phase twos, twice as many, about twice as many, were reported by hotline or direct reporting as were reported by inspection or direct observation by staff, which again is about twice as many uh, as were reported by some kind of referral for phase ones, I'm sorry, for phase twos. And this is an interesting contrast and um, this is a, a, a moment where I want to mention something else about the data, which was that one of the slides that we're not showing in this presentation just for sake of brevity is the distribution of the number of incidents by permittee. Um, but I do want to mention one salient point from that, which is that two permittees submitted far more uh, incidents or records of IDD incidents for 2014 than the other permittees. Uh, City of Tacoma, got those numbers here, they submitted um, 745 incidents, uh, and that's a phase one city. Phase two city of Bellevue uh, submitted 321 incidents, and among the, all the other permittees, the maximum that was submitted was 157. So these high number of incidents from these two particular permittees, one phase one and one phase two, definitely weights the uh, analysis here and the distribution of data. And I think that's one of the things we're seeing in this graph uh, with the stark difference between phase ones and phase twos for how they learned uh, about these uh, incidences. Okay, moving on to the methods used to uh, uh, trace the pollutants to their sources. Um, the three categories are shown here on the bottom along with the null category where source tracing information was not provided in the record. So visual and empirical methods by far are the most common um, uh, with uh, records without that information being uh, the second most prevalent. And I think it's interesting to note here that for illicit connections, the light blue bar, there were illicit connections that were um, uh, source traced both by visual methods, but also some, some form of in-pipe testing. And, you know, that makes sense if you think about it. Sometimes you don't necessarily need to do a fancy chemical test. You can smell what the pollutant is and you might be able to trace it back to its source just by uh, the absence or presence of flow, that sort of thing. Um, okay, moving on here to the next uh, set of, of uh, next set of graphs here for how, um, uh, what, what methods of indicators were used to determine what the pollutant was. By far the uh, most common method were visual methods uh, that included turbidity, presence of flow, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but again, likewise with the uh, source tracing methods, we see the illicit connections, relatively few numbers of those, but those are still distributed among multiple uh, 
uh, categories here, including the category where indicator method was not provided in the record. Um, but uh, that tells us that when it comes to an illicit connection or something in the pipe, multiple approaches um, can, be, can be really helpful. Whereas when it comes to illicit discharge, um, usually the visual approaches are, are gonna be dominant for the simplest way to get to that information. Okay, lastly, the distribution of the methods used to correct or eliminate these uh, incidents distributed among the five categories on the bottom here, along with the null category where this information was not provided. Uh, the use of BMPs in cleanup uh, the, uh, is by far the most common. And again, this is a categorization of a lot of different discrete responses that were provided. So it is certainly possible to go deeper into this database and do kind of a drill down to ask specific questions like what types of BMPs were used, what type of cleanup method uh, was used as well. However, that information, again, was not required to be reported for IDDE reporting. So there's limited records that have that level of specificity. Um, that's part of the reason why we wanted to uh, group some of those responses together. Okay, and I also want to point out that when it comes to an enforcement method, um, it's about the same number of records that, were, that had some kind of enforcement action among phase ones and phase twos. So obviously a larger proportion among the phase one's records, phase one records. And I think this, uh, probably my guess is that this points to the difference in the enforcement requirements among the phase one and phase two permits. They both have enforcement requirements. I think phase two uh, permit talks about an escalating type of uh, enforcement where phase ones had to bring in their enforcement program earlier. So that may be what, uh, what this is capturing. Lastly, this category of no action needed. I think that's an important category to capture because sometimes you don't need to do anything. Either the, uh, whatever discharge has already occurred and there's no cleanup possible, or um, there was an unconfirmed report uh, as is shown by these, uh, by the kind of yellow bar of the um, non-IDDE events. All right, so I've got one slide here to summarize the, the statistics. Um, for anyone who's familiar with the chi-square statistic uh, when, it, when it's used in this type of way, um, the idea is to compare um, multiple vari variables to each other. And this can be done sort of using matrices or contingency tables. And anyone who's used matrices knows that when you start to get past about a three by three matrix, the results get very uh, comp uh, complex to, to report. So that's why we, we stuck to just pairs of variables um, to, 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 to limit that complexity. And we did uh, two types of um, comparisons, uh, well, two sets of pairs of variables here um, for this test. Just as an example, there's a lot more um, you know, potential comparisons that could be made. But what we did here was we compared, compared the pollutant type to these five categories and then we compared source tracing method to these three categories. Seven of those eight comparisons were significant at the 95% confidence level. The one that was not significant is shown in the slightly lighter text here where source tracing method was compared to how the problem was learned about. So this uh, analysis, the statistical analysis, really points to what information is associated among uh, it within the IDD records. Um, and as I mentioned, many other comparisons are possible and it requires defining a question to say, for example, how is the indicator method uh, related to the response time? Um, that's just an example. So uh, this, this project really sought to, um, to provide uh, the answers to the questions that CIDR was asking, which uh, related to what types of events are occurring, how is this information being reported, that sort of thing. And uh, we wanted to take it one step further just to start to bring some quantitative analysis uh, into this. And I do want to mention that uh, the high number of records from Bellevue and City of Tacoma were such that we decided to do the statistical analysis on the data set with and without those uh, cities' records. And the results were the same. Seven of eight comparisons were significant, but the specific responses for each of these categories did change a little bit. In other words, the pollutant type, you know, there's a lot of different pollutant types and there's many different ways that the problem was learned about. So the mix of these uh, statistically significant connections between those categories were different um, uh, at a specific level for the data set without Bellevue and Tacoma's data. But what this tells me is that because overall the same number of comparisons were significant is that 
um, there's a strong influence of those high number of records from Bellevue and Tacoma. All right. So I've got a few conclusion slides here. And for the 2014 data, um, I'm just going to bring this all up here. The most common pollutants seen, hydrocarbons related to, and also vehicle fluids. Most common sources were related to spills. Most common source tracing and indicator methods were those based on visual. And the most common corrective action were those related to cleanup or using BMPs. Um, and it should be pointed out that uh, the frequency of occurrence here is only kind of one piece of the picture. It doesn't really get at the question of like, what is the, the highest priority for municipalities to address? What is the most concern in terms of receiving water quality? There needs to be other questions that are, uh, that are asked to get to that information. And I think a regional database like this can really help with that information where you have a large data set that represents many municipalities from across the region. Um, and you can ask very specific questions about, for example, among those hydrocarbon pollutants, what were the most common source tracing methods used? How quickly were they addressed? What was the percentage of those that could not be addressed where the um, discharge had already kind of washed away? That sort of thing. So, uh, but for now, just for the 2014 data and for the goals of the study to help the CIDR program, um, uh, the, the frequency of occurrence uh, was an important, important information to provide. Okay, regarding the data format, um, as we mentioned, the data were provided in many different formats and this highlighted the need for standardizing the reporting uh, in order to uh, meet the CIDR goals. Um, as Greg mentioned also, there was a data entry form that was sent out to permittees in 2014 as an op uh, for optional use. And during this data evaluation, we updated that form. Uh, we kept the number of fields at the same, 16 fields to report for each IDE incident, but we provided more detail about the incident and standard language that could be used to describe it. Um, in addition, there was a, a lot of emphasis on keeping uh, the data entry as efficient as possible to not increase the burden on permittees for uh, redundant permitting. You know, we, we know that you have to do G3 notifications and many jurisdictions have their own database that they use for internal purposes. So there was a great interest in, in not increasing the amount of effort required to report uh, IDDE records. And this updated form is uh, under consideration for the uh, planned permit renewal in 2018. All right, lastly, conclusions about the database. Um, I just have a few suggestions about how a regional database can be used uh, in this way. The first is to make an inquiry on a local basis to look up how specific uh, discharges are addressed in certain areas. Another type of uh, question that, or another type of use of this type of beta database is to share information across jurisdictions. For example, to compare enforcement methods. And third, to track information on a regional basis. Uh, it's possible to look up what type of pollution occurred over time in multiple areas. Obviously, because this uh, effort was just for 2014, we don't have that uh, spread of data over time to, to, to make that type of inquiry now, but that's certainly a uh, potential the way that the database could be used as more years of data are added. Okay, that brings, to, brings us to the conclusion of the presentation, and we'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you.